I just completed my three-year tenure as a Gilliam Fellow, and in that time I've gotten to know what kinds of applicants HHMI is looking for for the Gilliam Fellowship. This is a very special fellowship, with a ton of moving parts, so I wanted to create a guide to help you navigate the application process. However, the application process has had some major changes in 2023, and so reading other applications might not even be helpful anymore. So, what does it take to win the fellowship now? I interviewed Gilliam program administrators and recipients in order to put together a clear-cut guide on winning the Gilliam Fellowship. So what distinguishes the Gilliam Fellowship from all the other kinds of graduate fellowships out there? The Gilliam Fellowship is run by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, abbreviated HHMI, with the long-term goal of advancing equity and inclusion and promoting healthier training environments across the scientific landscape. They care about really great science, but they also care about making science a place that students actually want to stay in. It accomplishes that in a rather unconventional way. You apply for the fellowship in an advisor-advisee pair. Yep, that's right. Both you and your advisor both apply with one application in order to describe the potential that you both bring for fulfilling the goals of the program. In return, the benefits of the program are quite unconventional as well. And I think in order to have any shot at getting this fellowship, you really have to understand how HHMI invests in the fellows. First, let's talk about the funding structure. In addition to an annual stipend for the graduate student and an institutional allowance for the school, each Gilliam Fellow is given a discretionary fund to help support their graduate activities. Those funds can be used in many ways. Supporting your professional development by going to conferences or courses, helping you with any medical expenses or housing insecurity, and also helping fund any technology you might need to complete your PhD. The advisors are also given an allowance. HHMI also has a track record of running fellowships using what I call the recurring touch points model, meaning they make an effort to bring the fellows to their headquarters every year as a form of professional development in order to build community. For the Gilliam Fellows, this takes the form of attending the annual Gilliam meeting every year from the beginning to the end of the fellowship, as well as attending HHMI investigator meetings in your first year virtually virtually and in your second and third year in person in order to facilitate networking. I don't think I'd be alone in saying that this is one of the main perks of the Gilliam Fellowship, because the Gilliam community is really unparalleled in its ability to support each other. And then they also invest in your advisor. Your advisor is given a year-long mentorship training where they at one point also come to HHMI's headquarters. They also give your advisor an allowance that they can use to promote equity and inclusion and healthy training environments at your school, department, or program. So as you can tell, it's very different from other fellowships. If you want more logistical information, HHMI has a program announcement and also a webinar that I've linked both below, and I really highly recommend that you read and watch both. But I mention this because HHMI will have you touch on these benefits at some point in the application process, and you really need to drill home why these specific benefits are important for you. You will also want to explicitly link yourself as someone who will help fulfill the goals of the program. So I'll be covering those now by going through parts of the program announcement. All right, so we are currently at the Gilliam Fellows program website. And what we're trying to understand is what is the goal of the fellowship? So in order to understand this goal, there are a few things I want to flag for you. First, scroll down a little bit, right? And here you have a beautiful one sentence summary. Their goal is to equip science leaders to build a more inclusive ecosystem. All right, so what does that really mean? Let's go down a little bit. And there's a few things I wanna flag for you. First, there is this 2024 Gilliam Info session, and that consists of Zoom recordings that are going through some slides. And this basically, you know, was meant for campus representatives, but you should definitely watch it as it goes through every single part, like the minutia of the application. And I think it's really good to get a sense of what the admissions committee will be thinking about. All right, so now I want to flag for you the 2024 program announcement which you should be reading and referencing very often in your application process. But let's take a look here because, um, again, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you definitely should, but there are a few things I want to highlight for you. 
First is when you're trying to think about, you know, the goal of the fellowship. We kind of talked about that a little bit, but let's take a step back and look at the goal of the Institute, the goal of HHMI. And they have it, you know, set up right here. Six core values, excellence, collaboration, innovation, integrity, inclusion, and developing others. So when you're thinking about the story you want to tell the admissions committee, think about whether you can use any of these words, whether any of them really speak to you and the story that you're trying to tell as a way to frame your story and your narrative through the perspective of what the Institute as a whole wants to accomplish. Now let's move to the goals of the Gilliam program, which are right here. And the thing I want to highlight for you here is the sentence. The Gilliam Fellows Program supports pairs of graduate students and their faculty advisors who together embody scientific leadership, an important component of which is a commitment to building an equitable and inclusive science culture. So the translation here from someone who's been a part of the fellowship is they are looking to promote scientific leadership in a two-pronged way. First is through the graduate student through which you know, the graduate student has a lot of potential to go many different places far after their graduate school careers. Um, and so they want to train you in scientific leadership so that no matter where you end up going, the people who come in with you and after you have equitable opportunities. That means making a space a good place to work for people who have been historically marginalized or have not had the same advantages that other people might have had. That is the translation from the grad student perspective. And then the reason why they care about faculty advisors is because they don't want the change at that institution to stop when you leave, right? The faculty advisor presumably is going to stay at the institution. And the idea is that they're going to have the ability to make a long-term change in that institution by training your faculty advisor. All right, so speaking of that, I'm going to go to the next part, which is advisor specific conditions. And I want to flag this for you right here. As part of the Gilliam Award, the advisor is required to complete a year long course in scientific professional development that focuses on developing mentorship skills that supports persons from all backgrounds. Okay. And the reason I wanted to flag that for you is this is a lot of work for your advisor. Right? Not only are they writing a whole separate application that is just as much work as the application you're writing for the fellowship, but they also have to participate in monthly virtual modules, um, things that may require them to be really reflective. And then they will also be going to HHMI in person twice in order to um, really process a lot of that. And so you have to make sure that you tell your advisor that this is expected of them. Because a critical goal here is to not only pick, you know, a pair that has a lot of potential, but to pick a pair that has a faculty advisor that is actually committed to investing this time, even in the midst of their busy science schedule. So there's a lot in that program announcement. So how exactly do they measure all of this? Let's go through the criteria. Your application will undergo multiple rounds of review by faculty and also leaders in graduate education that do equity and inclusion work. They are not necessarily formally affiliated with HHMI, but they could be. Some of these readers have read applications before, but there are also many readers that are new every year. They will be given a rubric that they're using to score the advisor-advisee pair. The major question they'll want to answer is, what is the potential of this advisor advisee pair in fulfilling our goals? So in the program announcement, HHMI explicitly lists the criteria that they are using to evaluate the advisor advisee pairs. I will read it because it's just so important to make sure you have this down. The first one. Demonstrated ability of student to formulate and creatively pursue interesting scientific problems and their ability to clearly communicate ideas. Two. Commitment of student to advancing equity and inclusion in science as demonstrated by their activities and or their experiences that have shaped their leadership philosophy on equity and inclusion and communication of how they plan to contribute to equity and inclusion in science in their future career. Three, demonstrated commitment of thesis advisor to develop as an effective mentor. Four, 
demonstrated commitment of advisor to advancing equity and inclusion in science and their role in helping to foster a healthy academic scientific ecosystem for all constituencies, such as students, postdocs, early career faculty at their institution. Your application has to be a resounding yes to all of the criteria for you as an advisor advisee pair, both of you. I cannot emphasize that enough. So I'm gonna give you specific advice for each parts of the application, but I also wanted to give you some general advice before we get started. First, one thing that I think I did that moved my advisors and my application to the yes pile was making sure that there was congruence between both of our applications. Even though it is the same application, you and your advisor have two separate portals and you cannot see what the other person is saying. In order to address this and make sure there was congruence, I had several meetings with my advisor where we made sure to just get to know each other as human beings and also in the scientific context. We were actively strategizing what kind of stories we could pull out in both of our experiences to create a cohesive story to help win this award. Second, always make sure to keep in mind that HHMI is an organization that funds people, not projects true in their whole pipeline and it is especially true in the Gilliam Fellowship. So don't worry so much about the exact project and whether you will actually be doing it in a few years. Just make sure you communicate it well. My third piece of advice is to make sure your advisor really understands that there's a lot of work required from them for this fellowship. It's not like a typical fellowship where they help you write the grant and they write you a letter of reference. No, no, no. As you know, they have their own major part of the application, but they're also going to do some major training as well. And it's really important that they understand that because they'll have to highlight their eagerness for that training. So from 2023's application on, there are some major changes that we should talk about. So historically, the Gilliam Fellowship was a fellowship for students who come from populations that were historically excluded from science, either on the basis of race, class, disability, etc. The goal was to prepare those scientists to, one, assume leadership roles, especially in a college and university context, and two, to help them foster a healthier and more inclusive academic ecosystem. The fellowship application has now changed in four major ways. First, this is now an open competition. Before, students had to meet the eligibility of being from a historically excluded population in science. And also, universities only received a certain number of nominations that they could use to nominate the students who would then submit an application. Now, it is a completely open competition. Anyone can apply, regardless of their personal background or the institution they attend. Second, there is a major de-emphasis of academia as a career goal. The fellowship used to have academic careers be a major goal of the fellowship. Now the fellowship has embraced that scientists could go to many different careers, and the goal is to help you fortify yourself and your skills to make those environments healthier. Third, rather than asking you for a list of specific metrics like publications, they will ask you for your five contributions to science. The goal here is to measure contribution to science in many different ways and to reduce a hyper-emphasis that has existed on publications as one of the ultimate sources of contribution to the scientific community. Fourth, the scientific research statement has been reduced from five pages to three pages. This means you have to be more clear and concise when you describe your research. Just a quick note here, and these are my personal thoughts, not those of HHMI. These changes have the potential to really help the goals of the fellowship, but also seriously detract from them. Opening the fellowship up means that anyone from any university can apply, which honestly is a wonderful change. It means that we can finally have Gilliam Fellows from universities all around the country, including those that don't have formal HHMI affiliations. That was a major barrier before, and basically made it so that the same institutions were basically sweeping the Gilliam Fellowship. So I am super excited about that. The difficulty here is that if anyone can apply, people who don't really take the goals of the Fellowship seriously or really need those spaces could get the Fellowship and win it. For that reason, I seriously recommend that you reflect on why you want the Fellowship. 
It's more than just a fellowship. It's not like, you know, NSF or an NIH grant, right? It's a community of people who really, really care about creating inclusive and just spaces everywhere they go, and they're not afraid to fight for it. The fellow community has been one of those spaces where people could have those conversations without feeling unsafe. I know one goal in opening the fellowship up is to make sure that people who have been harmed by science as an institution aren't necessarily always doing the work. This means that making healthier spaces is still going to be focused on elevating marginalized groups. If having sometimes difficult discussions around creating inclusive and healthy community for people in marginalized groups is not something you're really interested in, you might want to think about whether this is the right fellowship to apply to. But if making equitable spaces is something that you are really passionate about, whether because of personal experience or desire to grow, by all means apply. Just know that if it's not something you are used to experiencing, approach from a place of humility, approach from a place of growth. So now let's move on to the specific components of the Gilliam Fellowship application. The structure of the application is very extensive, so I've shown it to you in the following format. So you can see there is your application, your advisor's application, and lots of parts connected to both. The little nuances of all of those parts are covered extensively in the Gilliam Fellowship program announcement, as well as a public Zoom webinar that I've linked below in the description. I highly recommend that you watch those videos because I'm not going to be covering all the minutia that they cover. But if you have any questions, feel free to drop them either in my comments or email gilliam at hhmi.org. My video is an advice video, so I'm going to assume that you're already familiar with some parts of the application. Under your application, you have six parts. Scientific contributions, dissertation research project overview, equity and inclusion statement, career statement, student research slash conflict resolution statement, and a letter of support. For each of these components, I will be giving you my specific advice and also sharing with you the characteristics of a successful application that was given to me when I got my fellowship. This will help contextualize the application with rubrics that tell you how they may be approaching that part of the application. But note that I was given these in 2020 when I got my application back, and these are always subject to change. So for scientific contributions, the goal is to showcase who you really are in the scientific realm. Who are you as a scientist? Did you diversify the speakers at your department's speaker series? Did you publish? Did you present at conferences? Did you TA courses? Put things here that you are really proud of. They don't have to be conventional metrics of success like publications. They can be things that really describe who you are in the scientific community. They can describe how you've contributed to diversifying science as a whole. Next is the dissertation research project overview. This is a research plan that highlights what your current plan is for your dissertation and is basically the most similar part of this application to other fellowship applications. Because scientists are going to be reading this statement, it needs to be understandable to a broad scientific audience. One important part of being a leader is thinking about your audience when you communicate. This is your chance to show that you can communicate to a wide variety of scientists, even if they're not in your field. And also to showcase that you have a clear plan forward, even if it doesn't feel like you have a clear plan forward. You can use some science jargon if you've properly introduced it and if it is a core part of your plan, but if someone outside of your field cannot keep up with your research plan, it is not clear enough. Remember, HHMI funds people, not projects. So if your dissertation plan changes along the way, that's okay. So here are the metrics that defined a successful research plan in 2020. Directly through the narrative and indirectly through references, makes clear the project's significance to the field using language that is understandable by a non-specialist scientist. And provides a clear rationale for the proposed experiments, methods that map well to the aims, discusses the feasibility of the experiments, explains the results of the experiments within the context of the overall hypothesis, and includes alternative strategies. 
So you want to do all of that. Basically, any grant writing class or principles of grant writing that you may have heard apply to this research plan. Now let's move on to the equity and inclusion statement. This is perhaps one of the most important statements of this fellowship, because this is where you tell them exactly how you fit in and will help them fulfill their goals. Remember, they are looking for people who are committed to creating healthier and more equitable professional spaces. To answer this prompt, I have four pieces of advice for you. First, Reflect on who you are. What drives you to care about equity and inclusion? How are you connected to this work? Think about what you can both give and receive. What are your identities and experiences? And what can you contribute to the Gilliam community? So Willow decided to join us for a little bit. My second piece of advice is to ground your statement in evidence. What evidence is there of the things that you've done? What experiences have you tangibly had that connect you to this work? Why do you care so much about this work? What have you done to make experiences more equitable? And how have your experiences as a person of a particular identity or group shaped who you are in this kind of work? I know this can feel like bragging and can feel really uncomfortable, but you have to be able to show that you are proud of everything you've done and where you've come from, especially if it comes from a place of personal experience. Okay, Willow's leaving, bye. My third piece of advice is to find a way to write this statement as authentically as you can, rather than modeling it after a statement that was written by a previous winner of the fellowship. I know that it's tempting to ask people for their fellowship so you can get a sense of what a winning fellowship looked like. But many Gilliam Fellows wrote about very personal and sometimes traumatic experiences and how they overcame it and how they changed. If what you wrote about doesn't really parallel what they experienced and if the structure they used doesn't quite fit with your experience and your story that you're trying to tell, It'll only really hurt your application to assume that your story has to be written in the way they wrote their essay. Resist the temptation to use other people's essays as like formulas for how you can tell your story. Instead, what I recommend is write your story your way. Then go to the writing center or go to friends to see if it comes off the way that you want it to come off. On that note, while you can ask past fellows to see their applications, please be respectful when you ask. Remember that people aren't entitled to share their applications with you, especially for something like this fellowship where there's a really high likelihood that something personal and difficult was discussed in the essay. And if they do choose to share it with you, please do not copy their structure and for the love of God, do not distribute their essay to anyone without their permission. Hey everyone, so just one thing to add, a really gracious Gilliam Fellow offered her application for you all so you can get a sense of what a winning one does look like, so I'm going to add that to the description below. And my last piece of advice is to answer the prompt completely. So what I recommend you do is literally copy the prompt and then highlight in a different color each different part of the prompt. Then, when you finish your statement, go back to the colors, the different parts of the prompt, and make sure that every color can be found in your document. Sometimes you can even delineate it explicitly. I am answering this part of the prompt in this part of the essay. But that is, you know, if that's something that resonates with you. So in 2020, this statement was called the leadership statement. So when I wrote it, it was a little bit different but every part of the equity and inclusion statement now were things that I highlighted in my leadership statement. To drive my point home, these are the characteristics of a successful essay in 2020. Provides evidence of the student's leadership track record and articulates how students intend to foster a more inclusive scientific ecosystem through their future scientific leadership efforts. I made sure to have like a whole philosophy section in my essay as well. Okay. So now let's move on to the career statement. This one is a little more straightforward since it's about career aspirations. And no, you are not forever bound to the career that you wrote about in your application. Just write about what you're thinking now and see how it lands when you put pen to paper or keyboard to word document. Make sure that you include your aspirations for equity and inclusion in this statement as well. 
In 2020, these were the characteristics of a successful statement. Discusses professional and personal aspirations and their impact on students' science. Articulates the value of inclusion in science and future directions for making the scientific ecosystem more inclusive. So next is the student resources section. And this is one that was added to the application the year after I applied. So I never did it but I interviewed quite a few people who did and received the fellowship. Here, you're focused on two aspects, student resources for mental health and conflict resolution strategy. For student resources, you wanna answer the question, what are student resources that exist on campus to help you take care of yourself mentally? They're having you write this statement because the reality is graduate student mental health is in the trash because of toxic work environments, not because of the graduate student's own choices. The fellowship is hoping that by going through the process of exploring what resources there are on your campus in advance, before you might need it, that you will take advantage of those resources. So the second part of this section is a conflict resolution strategy with your advisor. You have to write about how you will approach any conflict with your advisor when they do arise. And similarly to the student resources uh, statement, the goal is to have you, you know, think through what you might do with a conflict before you are in the middle of a conflict with your advisor. You can't quite do a strategy and execute a strategy in the middle of a conflict that well. Finally, the last part of your application is a letter of support from a faculty mentor that is not your advisor. I highly recommend that this is someone who knows you extremely well, both in a scientific context and also in context of any equity and inclusion work that you might be highlighting. But if it's not the case, just make sure that they write about both of those things. I shared my draft statements with my faculty reference who wrote my letter and made sure to meet with them to discuss what parts of my application would be helpful for them to highlight. And then the 2020 characteristic of a great letter of support was the following. Letters of support from a previous advisor that specifically addresses the student's scientific and leadership potential. So that wraps up your section of the application. Now let's move into the work that your advisor will have to do. And what you'll notice immediately is it's a lot more work than what they might be used to for a graduate fellowship. It's basically on par with the amount of work that you have to do with this fellowship. There are six major components. First is a bio sketch that covers five contributions to science, five advisor authored applications that are relevant to your specific project, a training record data table where your advisor will fill out, you know, all the trainees they've had, postdocs, graduate students, undergrads, and also if any of them came from marginalized backgrounds and then highlighting six trainee career outcomes. So what did those trainees go on to do after their PhDs? What they're measuring here is whether your advisor has a track record for mentoring students and that therefore they will mentor you well from both a scientific and career perspective. The second thing they'll have to list is a list of grants, which basically shows HHMI that they'll be able to financially support you during your time in their lab. Third is a letter of support that they have to write for you. And uh, advisors, you know, will typically have this done in all grants, so they should know how to write this. Four is a mentoring plan, and that is going to cover the following. Their mentoring philosophy, a conflict resolution strategy similar to what you had to write, a strong personal narrative for why they are applying to this fellowship as your co-applicant, and what they want to gain out of this training and, and this fellowship as a whole. I personally tried to make sure that my advisor had synergy with what he wrote in his application as what I wrote in mine, but this isn't a requirement, I don't think. But I think it probably is a requirement for the conflict resolution strategy. Like, they are probably assuming that you will have discussed that strategy, but, you know, your call. In 2020, the characteristics for a successful application for this portion were as follows. Focuses on the student's career aspirations and provides clear evidence of a strong collaborative relationship between the advisor and the student, including in the development of the research plan. Maps well to the student's specific strengths and areas for improvement. Includes sufficient details about the scientific 
personal and career development of the student, including the advisor's role in training the student and planning for their professional development to optimize the next step in their career, the frequency of advisor-advisee meetings, and a well-considered plan for conflict resolution. And provides an insightful reflection of the impact of the HHMI mentor training and how it will be assessed. The last part is the equity and inclusion statement. And similar to you, they also have to write one. It is going to be a statement very similar to yours, but the difference here is that your advisor is already in some sort of leadership position, so they're able to articulate from a very different perspective the way they've been able to be change agents in creating healthier or more equitable spaces. The final portion is the proposed activities for your advisor's allowance. So this is the project that they're gonna carry out um, and they have funding for to basically make these spaces healthier. And it's your advisor that carries that out, not you. That's why they're writing this statement. Gilliam basically gives your advisor money to help them enact their vision of what a healthier and more equitable academic ecosystem would look like. The idea here is that the Gilliam Fellowship will benefit your department long after you leave. And that's why they have, you know, your department do the work, also to not distract you from your science. So in order to answer this, your advisor needs to come up with a plan for what they're going to use the funds for. In 2020, here were the characteristics they were looking for. Demonstrates the advisor's commitment to removing undue burden from populations historically excluded from and underrepresented in science by taking ownership of the project from concept to execution. Demonstrates the advisor's personal investment in diversity and inclusion at the graduate level as reflected in the proposed activities articulates the specific institutional challenges to diversity and inclusion at the graduate level and how the proposed activities would address the challenges, and discusses how planned activities would have a broader impact on the graduate program, department, and or the institution. So the largest piece of advice I can give for this entire section is to really relay to your advisors that HHMI is looking for people who are ready to transform themselves and their communities. They don't have to have it all figured out. I think humility goes a long way here. The more that your advisor is open to changing, and the more effectively that they can communicate that they're open to changing and that they are willing to use this mentorship training as a, you know, opportunity for changing, the higher the likelihood that you will get the fellowship. Now I'll answer some quick Q&As. If my research is translational, can I still apply? Yes. As of 2023, translational research is still eligible under the Gilliam guidelines. What do I do if I am co-advised or have two advisors? So there is one advisor that applies for this application. So you would have to pick a primary advisor. You can mention in your application that you have multiple advisors, but for the purposes of this application, there will only be one advisor. Only the primary advisor is considered to be the project director and will be able to use the discretionary funds for you know equity and inclusion work. So what that means for the purposes of this application is that your primary advisor will fill out, you know, all the components of the application, that that advisor is going to be, you know, getting the discretionary funds so they can do the equity and inclusion work, and they're also going to be the one participating in that year-long mentorship training. There is an exception here, and that is if your primary advisor has already done HHMI's mentorship course, then you know a co-advisor can do it this time instead. But I think you have to get permission for that, so I would communicate with HHMI on that. The third question, my advisor has never done equity and inclusion work before. Does that mean that I can't get the fellowship? I think this one's a harder one, right? Because, you know, there will be advisors that have done lots of equity and inclusion work, but you have to remember that this is framed from the perspective of an advisor-advisee pair and both of your combined potential to do work in that space. So if they haven't done any of that work before, they could frame their application through the lens of a deep desire to do that work and also to improve their mentorship potential so that you as a graduate student will succeed. 
This is gonna have to come from a place of humility for your advisor because admitting that they want to grow means that they have to admit that they are not exactly where they wanna be right now and that is totally okay. But sometimes admitting we're not where we wanna be is hard, so just be aware of that. Thanks for sticking with me thus far. As you can tell, this is a pretty long and complicated fellowship to apply for, but the community and the professional development opportunities are totally worth it. Make sure you subscribe, and if you have any questions, feel free to comment them below. I'll answer any questions related to the fellowship so that other people can also benefit from getting the answer. Good luck everyone, you're gonna do great!